This morning I'm going to be teaching about the Feast of the Harvest. And this morning is about, the, it's not necessarily the conclusion of it, but it's the reason for the harvest. It's the reason why we talk about the harvest. And this Feast of the Harvest is a, is a part of this that, that I believe that if you'll pay attention to, don't get bogged down. I'm going to share a little bit out of the Old Testament. And sometimes people say, well, when you do the Old Testament, it really seems to slow it down. Listen, it shouldn't, because everything that's in the Old Testament confirms what's in the New Testament. Amen? And so we want to take just a few minutes this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And we're going to go to verse 20 through 23 this morning as my text, and then kind of branch out from there. But as we conclude this series, I, I want you to, to, to realize that there, this has been something about the harvest that has been preached for years. It has been something that God has spoke of. God originated the harvest for us. How many of you enjoy taking part in the harvest. You know what? That, that, that simply means, how many of you like to eat? That's, there you go. I can tell by most of you that we enjoy it a lot. Amen. That, somebody asked me the other day, Pastor, what are your hobbies? Eating is probably the first of my hobbies. So I enjoy that. But I enjoy taking part in the harvest because I enjoy the, the, the blessings of what God's bounty is, what God has blessed us with, what God has given to us that we might enjoy. And so I've, as, as I was growing up, I used to love it when I would see the, the corn begin to come in because I love sweet corn and I love to see the, the watermelon as it comes in and, and the, the different produce items when, when, as they would come in. And I just, it's just such a, a great time for me because I love to eat all those things fe, uh, that are fresh vegetables. And, and as God blesses the earth and we see that come in, it's, just, uh, it's a thrill for me uh, to do that. It was, it was predominantly the, the, the harvest has been something that the feast of the harvest has been something that God has done. And this morning I'm going to try to tie in some of the Old Testament uh, works of the, of the feast that God has designed. And I'm going to use that to understand this text. I'm going to preach out of this particular text this morning. So if you have your Bibles, keep them there. If you don't, this morning, I'm sure it's because either you have them memorized or you know that we're going to show it up on the screen. So stay with me for the next few minutes. Scripture reads as this. It says, starting in verse 20 of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are in Christ at his coming. I ask if you would to bow your heads with me as we begin, and just, just pray right now. I want you to do this with me. Would you pray that God would open your ears to hear and open your hearts to receive? Would you join with me as we pray that way? Heavenly Father, right now, God, I pray that you would touch and, and you would allow the Holy Spirit to minister. I believe, Lord, that right now you want to speak to us about the, the necessity of being prepared God being ready and our hearts being prepared. And I pray that you would touch these lips of clay, that I would speak the words that you want to be spoken. And, and Lord, that you would open the ears that they would hear and that, the, that open the hearts that they would receive the word. And I pray that, God, you would touch each of us, prepare us for this time of harvest that we have. And we thank you. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for that that is done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we look at this, we, I was sharing with you about the feasts, and there are three different feasts that the, the children of Israel have had since they left the, the Egypt, and, and God brought them into the land out of, the, out of the, the confinement of Egypt. God gave them the land that He had promised, and years before in Abraham, God had promised that He was going to give them this land of blessing. And he was going to bless them, and He was going to bring forth this promise. But as they left Egypt, they began to travel across the wilderness, and God began to speak to them and said that there are three feasts that He wanted them to keep. And He points them out. And, and if you have your uh, Bibles, you may want to go with me to this section of Scripture. And I want you to kind of relate this to where the passage that I read in my text this morning uh, to this Old Testament uh, passage of scripture. Go ahead. Uh, it's in Exodus, the 23rd chapter, starting in verse 14. 
And, and if you have your uh, Bibles, you may want to stay with me or mark this as a reference to where we're going to be. It says, three times a year you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, and you shall eat, uh, and you shall eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded you, and at the time appointed in the month of Abib, um, for you, it you, you, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. He goes on in verse sixteen, and he says, and the feast of the harvest uh, of, the, the, of the first fruits. Of your labor which you have sown in the field. And then finally, the third feast that he speaks of is the feast of ingathering. At the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors at the field. Now, the feast of Passover is something that we're all familiar with. We, we understand this feast of Passover. This feast of Passover was one that God told them as they left the, 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 go back in the Old Testament a little bit, where God had brought them out of the land of Egypt. He had delivered them from their bondage of imprisonment that he had brought them from. And, and, and they were to celebrate this on a regular basis so they could be reminded of what God had brought them from. And they were to be reminded of this. They were to, to have this unleavened bread, this feast of unleavened bread or this feast of Passover, if you will. And what that was to signify is, is that when the death angel came to mark the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, that God sent forth the death angel and he was going to bring them out of this bondage. And they were to celebrate this uh, feast and they were to take a lamb and slay it. And then they were supposed to take the blood of the, the lamb and place it upon the doorpost and the mantle of their heart, uh, of, the, of the door. And, and, and in that reality of it, we see... This feast beginning to be something that is, that is so significant to us. You see, uh, when we, we were coming together and we would bring this together, we would realize the sacrifice and they would take a lamb. And, and once a year, we don't do it every year, but when we, we celebrate this feast of Passover and we'll have a Passover Seder here at the church, and we've had that before, and we talk about the significance of what each item represents and what it means for us in this Passover meal. Because I'm going to tell you something, when we celebrate the Passover and we realize that, now listen, I, I know somebody said, well, Pastor, we don't celebrate these feasts and we don't realize them, but every feast that I'm talking of and every feast that I read, out of Exodus is significant because it's an event that happens not only to the children of Israel, but it also is happening in the world to change the world. The significance of the Passover was at this very season in the time of Christ's death and that Christ became the Passover lamb and he became the sacrificial lamb. You see, there is no redemption of sin if it had not been for a sacrifice. You see, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want you to turn to somebody, look them right in the eye and tell them you're a sinner saved by grace. You see, we couldn't save ourselves. We were all lost and we were born into sin because all of us have an earthly father. I know that there's a few of us, Chuck, that, well, we don't look like we were born. Kind of might have been hatched. But anyways, we were all born. We all have an earthly father. And that earthly father was born into us because of the curse that was placed upon mankind when man sinned in rebellion in the garden against God. And that sin had become something that separated us from the love of God. But God sent forth His Son, His only Son, to die on a cross that became the sacrificial lamb. And as when we, we apply His blood to our hearts, we become forgiven, redeemed by His blood. Amen? Amen. And when we ask Him to forgive us, we place that upon it. And, and let me tell you something. It's significant because I, I, when I, I look at my life and I think sometimes there are things and, and a lot of people will talk about religion as being their, their, their salvation, but there is only one way to be saved and that is through Jesus Christ. When we look at this and we begin to realize the importance of the Passover, you see, it was Jesus who came and Jesus who became. When he stood with his disciples, he was preparing for the Passover meal the night before he was taken. The Bible says that he stood before his, his disciples and, and he began to demonstrate what he was. He said, this is my body, this bread that I, I break for you. He said, this I do in significance. 
significance and do this in remembrance of me and when we take communion in our church we are reminded of his body being broken for you amen he became your sacrificial lamb he became the remedy of sin he became the only deliverance from sin he took of the juice and he said this is the juice this is the new covenant this is the new promise listen I thank the Lord for the promise of God and all that he is. But the New Testament gives us new hope, new life. Amen? All th old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. In this we realize this Feast of Unleavened Bread was something that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. And as he was looking there, he began to talk about the next feast then that was going to come. This feast was called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of First Fruits. Oftentimes we refer to it as the Feast of Pentecost. Anybody remember Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks? It's 50 days, 49 days, and on the 50th day they would celebrate. Anybody remember anything in the Bible, say in the book of Acts, maybe the second chapter that happened on that day particular to make us uh, realize that that day has been fulfilled? What happened on that day? Let me share this with you. I'll just tell you. First of all, I want to share with you that after the Passover, Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, listen, we don't have a dead Savior. He died on a cross. They took him off the cross. They put him in the tomb. After the tomb, the Bible says he was resurrected. And for some 40 days, he dwelt among his disciples. And he, and he walked among them. And he was seen by so many. If you read on in the, that particular chapter in the, the book of 1 Corinthians, it describes all the events of Jesus' life and the many people that he met while he was alive. It was documented. It was proven. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. What we need to realize is that on the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, the Bible says God poured out His Holy Spirit. And He didn't pour out His Holy Spirit on us so that we can say, look what we've got, look what we can do. He poured it out on us so that we can go out and preach the gospel to every living creature so that we can tell the world there is a Savior. We can tell the world about the gospel. We can tell the world about the coming kingdom that God is trying to establish. When we come to this place, we realize the work and the power of God to transform lives. It is about the sake of the gospel. Pentecost is for the purpose of the harvest. Pentecost is about the first fruits. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ became the first fruits. In my text this morning, when we were reading that, we began to see that he was the first fruits. He was the risen lamb. He was the first one to be raised from the dead. And this new hope and this new promise. Amen. Jesus Christ became the first fruits. He became the first. Let me tell you this. We're going to get into this a little bit if I don't get ahead of myself. But I'm going to tell you something. There, are, there will be a day when we're going to be leaving this place. Whether we die or whether we're alive, there'll be a time and a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to leave this place. When we look at this and we see this in gathering day, that's coming up. We see the feasts and how they become prevalent in, in our lives. We realize and recognize the work of Passover. We recognize the power of Pentecost that was given to us. You see, this church age, this time of harvesting, was a period of time that God said, Go forth and gather your harvest. This church age that we are in right now is about gathering in the lost. Jesus told his disciples, see the harvest. And we preached about that. We talked about the ripeness of the harvest, the readiness of the harvest. We talked about the need of ministering to the harvest. There's a lost and dying world right outside of these church doors. And we come in and sit on padded pews in comfortable situations. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not about coming together. Only about this. It's about going out to the world and preaching and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. God has sent us out. We preached last week about being sent. We talked about the idea of God sending us out to preach the gospel because the urgency of the hour has come. The need of sharing it to go into the harvest, to preach the harvest, to practice preparing to bring in the harvest. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, tells us this. It says, 
he then would have suffered often since the foundations of the world. But now, once at the end of the age, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, has, and as it is appointed for men once to, to die, after that the judgment, as Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. As we look at this feast, we begin to realize the feast of the harvest is something that is magnificent. It is a celebrated harvest. It is something that is a degree and a level of, uh, of celebration because they celebrate the harvest. I know that as, when I worked on the farm, one of the greatest times that a, a farmer would have would be the time of, of harvesting because he knew if he had a good harvest, first of all, he was going to have plenty to eat. That's number one, the good thing about the harvest. The second thing about the harvest is, is he would be prepared for next season. He would have seed, and usually what they would do is set aside seed for, for planting, and then he would, it would, would sell the rest, and then some he would keep to eat upon. Feed his animals, whatever, and he would, that's the way we worked it. We had three different ways that we would produce it. But the harvest was used to manifest and, and to produce. I'm going to tell you something. What God has done is he has prepared the church so that we can be effective for the kingdom of God. So that we can prepare, so that we can have the blessings of God. Amen. Amen. So that this, this harvest is for us to enjoy. Amen. To have fellowship, to be around each other. It's good when we gather together as believers to have fellowship one with another. There's a lot of places that I go and gather with folks that I don't necessarily like. But when I gather with the body of Christ, there is something unique about it. Because we, always have, we all, all have one thing in common in the body of Christ. We're all sinners saved by grace. We were all lost, but now we're found. It's His redeeming grace that changes us and forgives us. And transforms us. You see, we see this in this feast and, and we hear the, the sacrifice. Now Jesus Christ beginning to describe his coming and beginning to describe that. The Bible tells us that he gave us victory over death through his sacrifice. In this harvest season, we celebrate the resurrection. We don't have to uh, be able to quote the entire Bible. We don't have to know it. We don't have to have a degree hanging on our wall. All we have to do is know that Jesus Christ can change a life. And he changed my life. And I will tell the world how he changed me. And how he can do the same for you. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, one of my favorite sections. A lot of you have heard this section of Scripture quoted and you've, you've heard it talked about, uh, especially at funerals, and, and, and you, you've heard this quoted, but it says this, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades or the grave, where is your victory? It says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of it is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When we see that section of Scripture, it's the significance that when I die, that is not all there is. It opens up the beginning. You see, another thing that we see in the harvest was not only the provision that God has made for us. Aren't you glad that he would said he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory? Yep. Amen? Amen? The blessings of what he has and the blessings of what we need, he is able to supply. My God will supply. He does supply. He cares for you. He takes care of you. The second thing we realize about the harvest is, is that it prepares us for what God wants us to do in the future. Amen. He brings this harvest so that we can be equipped to seed for next year. Now, some of you need to hear this. You need to get this. I don't expect... Our folks that are 70 and 80 and some that are 90 to be out working a bounce house. Some of them would probably enjoy it and they may even crawl in it. 
But something has to happen in the body of Christ. And it's, and it's being fruitful for the next year. You see, if we're going to bear fruit for the next year, it's because our next generation. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you are, 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 are say, 18, let's say 16, up through 30 years old. If you're that age bracket right there, you know what? You're not the, the church of tomorrow. You are the church right now of today. You are the church that needs to be actively involved. Sometimes we, we become effective because we've done it so long. But sometimes it's time that others step up to it. Amen? Amen. I will be the first to tell you, you know what? My, my wife and I, were we, were, we were watching one of the news reels and Alec just, I was so intrigued by that and, I, and the camera was close up to me and and, 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 I, and as I was talking and it showed it on there, I was, my wife and I were watching the news program and I thought, man, I, I was thinking good video, good camera work and everything like that. And I said, what do you think of it? And she said, you look old. <laughs> I'm thinking, ow, man, you know, of all the things she could have said, you know, you look bald. I would have accepted that, but you look old. What do you do to fix old, you know? Here, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know how long God will give me the strength to do what I'm doing. But my job and my task and your job and your task is to prepare the paths of the future so that when we can turn it over to them and we can sit and cheer you on. That's what the job should be. You shy away from the ability and the opportunities that are set before you. Somebody has to do it. So our faithfuls and those who have done it for so many years will say, Pastor, I'll carry the load. <laughs> I'm going to say something, and I love every one of our seniors. But, but I can tell you this. I, I, I had a friend of mine when we worked on a farm together, and he used to say, when a cow gets too old, it's time to give it up. I'm trying to be tactful. I'm trying, Sister Lou is looking, I'm making eye contact with somebody. I'm looking at, I'm gonna tell you something. Here's what I'm saying is this. We need folks. We need, we need the next generation to step up and take that and say, I will teach, I will preach, I will do. Amen? It is time that we pass on the baton. It is time that we realize you are saved by grace not to sit and look. You are saved to be busy about the kingdom of God. Some 150 people that go through our church doors. And how many times have we said, we need, we need, we need. It's because the harvest is truly plentiful. The harvest is very large. The harvest is ripe and ready. We need it. Because I can tell you this. Believe it or not. I want you to understand this. You guys can amen this. Believe it or not, I am not cool to teenagers. Uh, thank you. The strong amens from the gallery back there. Uh, I, I don't have the right hairdo. I know. I dress. My son tells me this all the time. He said, Dad, you dress and that makes you look old because of the way you dress. I said, no, son, you make me look old. <laughs> Here's the thing. And I will tell you this. I know this. I am, I am gaining in years. And when I need something done, I say, Joe, will you come and lift this for me? And then I usually tell him, Joe, let me show you how to do that, son, because you're not doing it right. <laughs> we need, we need you. But here's the thing. We need the seniors. We need our senior adults in this church because they give us direction. 
They tell us, they tell, I, I, we need to use the wisdom that they have incurred. They, they didn't get old just to sit there and look the nature part. They got old because they have experience and that experience speaks volumes on how to do what God has called you to do. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. The most important thing to remember is that Christ rose from the dead and became the first fruits of the harvest of the souls that would be redeemed by the resurrection of Christ from the grave. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Our hope is not just uh, for forgiveness from our sins. Our hope is in the risen Savior because He lives we will live also. Amen. Our greatest thought this morning should be not that my sins are forgiven, but that I have a home in heaven. This world and all of the, the future that it has, I'm going to tell you this. It cannot contain all the glory that heaven has. See, I can tell you this. Let me get, give, you, give you an insight. I have learned this. Because when I was younger and I was my 18, 19 and 20s and I was young in college, you know what? I wanted to be rich. And then I got married and now, no, just kidding. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. I, was, I went to college, I thought, well, I'm going to do this, and I was, I, all I was thinking, I, I, one time I thought I was going to be famous wrestler, and I thought I was going to be all these things, and I was going to have a career. I even, I, at one time I even thought if, they, if, if I could make it, I could make it to the Olympics. Then I woke up and realized all of those things were dreams, and you have the future to hope for so many different things. But when you get a little bit older, you start realizing the reality of it is, is this is not all there is. The Bible says we need to start looking towards the future. And that's in heaven. And you're never too young to start preparing for your future. You see, I wasted some years and some of you have wasted your years. Because you think right now is not that important. I can just coast through. It's all about me. It's all about what I'm going through. It's all about my moment. It's all about my minute right now in my time. I'm young. I have all my future ahead of me. I'm going to tell you something. You need to realize this. You're not, you're not able. You're not Superman. Just because you're younger doesn't mean you don't need to prepare for your future. I stood at the casket of too many teenagers who thought they were, they were incapable of, of dying at a young age. And I've stood at that point and I've realized the necessity of making a decision. You are never too young to realize the importance of the future that you have with God. You see, God did, it's not about just being forgiven. It's not about just the harvest. But I'm going to tell you something. This last part over here about the harvest is preparing for the future. You see, it's preparing for what is going to happen in the future. It's not just about the supplying of the immediacy for my needs. It's not just about the urgency of what is taking place uh, to sell and to profit now. But it's to, about the future. Amen. The harvest is preparing to plant for next year. For the future. One time I was in a group of ministers. There was probably about 25 of us there. They said, what is the most profound statement that you can make today? What is the most profound statement you can make? And I said, well, I looked at statistics the other day, and I found out that in the statistics they say this, in a room full of about 25 people, at least one of them will die in the next year. We all looked and thought, and one of the guys had had a heart problem, and he had... And he was a diabetic, and we all looked at him and said, uh-oh. We all started thinking, it, it, could it, let, me, let me share this with you. You're not promised your next breath. 
And so it's, it's important for you now to realize the importance of the future. Making a decision for Jesus Christ prepares you for no matter what comes your way, you have hope in glory. Not just hope today, not just hope in the, in the present or, or for the future of your being on this earth, but the future that you have eternally. Amen. Our victory over death, hell, and the grave comes through that. We see this as we, we move on just a little bit in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption, corruptible, shall have, have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. We shall be brought to pass, it shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. There will come a time, there will come a day, and you are never too young to hear this message. There, you are never too young to hear this message. When I thought about this particular section of Scripture, I thought about the idea of this last feast is the one that the Bible oftentimes refers to as this ingathering feast. This last, there, there will come a day, the Bible says that a trumpet of God will sound, if you will, in that particular, in 1 Corinthians, it says the trumpet of God. It's so unique to me how that this last feast is entitled the Feast of Trumpets. This in gathering, 2,000 years before Christ, God set forth a plan that there would be a trumpet that sounds. And he talks about it. And today we are told of the promise of a trumpet sounding. And that when that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen. I don't know about you. But it is time we get busy. Because I believe that in any day, at any moment, at any time, that trumpet could sound. I never will forget one time when I was just a, a young boy. I was about eight or nine years old. I remember my grandmother preaching that, uh, about the, the hope of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Preached about if you're not saved, you're not going. And I, I was about eight years old, and I remember I, I went down to the altar, and I cried a puddle of tears and asked God to forgive me, and I went home, and you know what? I kind of wandered away from that. That experience at eight years old, I kind of wandered away, and I, I forgot God, and I forgot church. I forgot the focus on the future. And when I, when I got to a point, I never will forget, I came home from school one day, there was no one at my house. My parents both worked, so when I walked in, my sister wasn't there, but I, I walked in and the house was empty. Usually somebody would be home, either my parents or a babysitter or somebody. So I walked in and I started hollering, anybody home, anybody home, nobody was there. I went through the house and looked in every room. Nobody was there, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll call dad's work. Hey, is, is Mr. Pratt there? I said, I haven't seen my dad. He's not at home. I was just wondering. No, he, he left some time ago. Hmm. So I called my mom's work. No, no, she went home. She left some time ago also. I thought, here's the first thing that began to run in my mind, Martin. This is the first thing I thought of. The rapture has happened and I have been left behind. So I started scrambling to, to think of anybody I could call, and everybody I called that I knew of that was local, they were all, they, they, they were all somewhere, and I, I called my grandmother's house, and it rang and rang, and I knew if, if, if my grandmother was home, the rapture hadn't happened, because I knew for sure she was going when it happened. And it rang, and it rang, and it rang. No answer. 
So I got down on my knees and I started crying. I said, oh, God, forgive me if it's not too late. Let my heart be ready, God. I, Lord, forgive me. And I started going through all the things that I knew of, boy, that I, and I started getting it right. Tears running down my face. And I thought for sure they had all gone and I had been left. You know what? When I began to look up towards heaven, I thought, God, you've forgiven me. About that time, I heard the front door open. My dad come walking up the stairs and looked right at me and he goes, what are you crying about? I said, Dad, I thought the rapture had happened and I thought for sure I had been left behind. I thought for sure I had been left here behind. And from that point, the rest of my life, I began to live rapture ready. I began to think about that every day. Am I ready? Should the Lord come? Am I ready? Should the Lord prepare my heart? Am I ready? Should that day be called? I think about that every day because I know that I've got to prepare. Not only me, but I've got to do my part to prepare everyone else. From that point on, I began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with anyone and everyone that I could. I began to share and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ, that God could forgive a sinner. If He could forgive a sinner like me, He can forgive a sinner like you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the things that you've done. What matters is, is that you have repented and God has forgiven you of your sins. But it's not all just about your sin being forgiven. It is about the future that you have in Christ. You see, the harvest is not just about the present need, but it's about the future. And the more that we can do to prepare for the future, the better off we'll be. Go ahead and pull that last one up. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you need to highlight this and underline it in your Bible. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You can only be comforted with these words when you're prepared for that day. The harvest is coming. We are in the season and we're at the end of the harvest. The Lord told his disciples over 2,000 years ago, go and reap the harvest. Signs and events have pointed us to the soon coming of Christ. Events that are happening in this world today are preparing us for what is about to be the most dramatic change that the world has ever seen. We are about to see the greatest event that has ever happened in, in the history of the world. And that is that Jesus Christ is going to step out on the clouds of glory. The trump of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which live and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. The greatest event that has ever happened is about to happen in this world. Are you ready for that event to happen? If you're not, you need to get ready. You need to take time to say, Lord, Every day, look at my heart. See me. If there's anything in me that would hinder me from going, if there's anything in my life, I ask you to forgive me. If there's anything in me, forgive me, oh God.